guests who I would like to introduce to you today, Devangana Koka, or just uh, for short, DEF. She is an experienced data scientist and strategist with years of experience in building intelligent systems across domains and geographies and has a research background in theoretical computer science, information retrieval and social network analysis. As far as I know, uh, Devi also worked on natural language processing and other um, topics in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, your interests include data-driven intelligence, data in, in the humanitarian sector, and data ethics and responsibility. So there are a lot of things, of course, to say in this direction on the topics that we're discussing today. And she has also been the, the lead for the India chapter of the nonprofit Data Kind. Um, and she's currently a data scientist and strategist at ThoughtWorks and uh, an associate with Outside International. It's a great pleasure to have you with us, uh, Dev. So you have the floor. Uh, I, I would love to hear from you uh, about your involvement in these topics. Thank you, Franca, for that kind introduction and for having me here. Um, an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, so I have I've been working in the space of data for social good for um, for more than six years now, and in that space, I have um, I've worked on various projects where data sort of became an important factor for uh, addressing some of the social issues. I've also worked on projects where um, data was uh, used for disaster response, and COVID actually is um, uh, one of the biggest uh, disasters that we have seen at least in the last few decades. Um, and there are, of, of course, a lot of questions and concerns that arise um, in terms of how this data is going to fan out, this data use is going to fan out over the next couple of years, because the last eight months have seen an unprecedented, unprecedented amount of data collection and usage in the context of health and all the peripheral areas. Um, so that's where I'm coming from in terms of looking at what are the responsibilities around this data, what are the ethical ways of using it and how to address some of those via the paradigm of data governance? Thanks, Beth. And I, and I have to say, you really have a cross-sectional insight, uh, both from the perspective of the private sector and uh, NGOs and public sectors. So I think this is something we'll be talking about uh, later today. You will have some interesting insights to share, I'm sure. Um, thank you. So next, I would like to invite up on stage uh, Jules. Um, are you yes. currently? Yes, you're there. Excellent. Yes, there. Jules Brice uh, <laughs> Chachueng Ambungua from Cameroon. He's a senior researcher at the Centre Pasteur du Cameroon, and he's an associate lecturer at the University of Yaoundé. Uh, he holds a PhD in biostatistics uh, from the University of Montpellier and a PhD in applied mathematics from the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon. Um, his research is centered around spatial temporal mo modeling, longitudinal data remodeling, um, and data collection and integration tools. And in particular, he's interested in uh, managing better data integration between different data to collection tools. So welcome, Jules. And, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Maybe you can uh, share some backgrounds on the kind of uh, data collection tools um, that you have been using in your connection to the uh, topic of data management to respond to COVID-19. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes, for more than four years, uh, my team and I have been developing an integrated platform for collecting data, reporting, and processing. This platform uh, is called uh, Placar. Since the start of the COVID-19 epidemic, this platform has been adopted by the Ministry of Public Health and is used to collect individual data uh, testing. Uh, it's with uh, a great pleasure that I participate in this uh, panel. We're, we're pleased to have you. Uh, 
uh, yeah. and uh, it's it's amazing to hear about what you have been building in Cameroon. So I, I look forward to hear more about this in our discussions. Um, yes. Great. And next, last but definitely not least, um, I would like to welcome Emanuele Gidotti uh, from Italy. He is currently a PhD student in finance at the University of uh, Neuchâtel in Switzerland. And uh, together with David Andia, he created a COVID-19 uh, platform. So this is a, a worldwide collaborative platform to provide reliable and unified data uh, to the scientific community. Um, he has also been a, a winner of the COVID R contest and a speaker at the European R users meeting on the usage of R for data science in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're glad to have you today with us, Emanuele, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a great pleasure to join such experienced uh, speakers for me. Uh, as I said, I'm a PhD student in Neuchâtel. I started to work for a research project on COVID-19 in March, where I realized the difficulty of accessing this kind of data that are in different formats and in different languages. So to simplify the access to the data, I started to develop this collaborative platform to harmonize the amount of heterogeneous data. The first prototype was actually part of the research paper that was later published in Springer Nature and showcased on the website of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Then a great thank to David Ardia, who in March joined the project, and thanks to him we were funded by the Institute of Data Valorization in Canada. Since then, uh, as you said, we won the COVID R contest, presented the project at the European R users meeting, and published the platform in the Journal of Open Source Software. Today, we count 3 million downloads and more than 100 people in the community around the project. Uh, we do our best to guarantee the data quality and consistency. However, this very much depends on the quality and consistency of governmental data providers around the world. Today, I'm here to share with you some of the challenges that I faced in the data collection and the limitations that I found in the data harmonizations across different countries and different states. Thank you, Emanuele. Excellent. So as you can see, we have a, a very diverse uh, range of, of speakers with us today, and I, I look forward to a very fruitful discussion. And you, uh, dear audience, um, I, I really ask you to get involved as well and uh, let us know what your questions are. So we will have sort of a couple of key big questions around which the discussion will be centered, um, but we are flexible to respond to any anything that you would like to ask our speakers. So please make use of the feed and, and the Q&A, the Q&A for the questions that you would like to pass on to the speakers. Um, and so uh, after having um, our panelists respond to the questions. We will open up the floor uh, for you to participate. Okay, excellent. So let's get started. As I said, there is many um, big questions around the topic of uh, data governance. Um, let's get started with our first uh, main question. And let me see if I can manage to share my screen. So I hope that you're able to see it now. Um, so what are some of the challenges you foresee with data collection and privacy for citizens? Um, as we have heard today, uh, most African countries and, and really countries around the world are realizing the needs to collect data to build effective solutions for COVID-19. And so this is really um, to get your personal insight uh, on what might the main challenges be. And so on that topic, as we just heard from you, Emanuele, I would love to um, ask you to the stage first uh, to share with us your insights on this question. Oh, yes, it's a real honor for me to open uh, this discussion. Um, so for me, it is clear that this is a trade-off uh, between privacy and uh, solutions. For privacy, we should release no data at all. Why for solutions? we should collect all possible data. So first, I believe that we should ask ourselves, why do we need the data? And what problem are we trying to solve with the data? 
because different problems may need different data that should be collected in different way and shared in different way. So I'll give an example. Uh, suppose we want to implement a contact tracing application. It is true that we may uh, identify a person with only four points obtained by geolocating his device. But in this case, there is no need to geolocate this device. Indeed, you can collect anonymized contacts among devices without collecting the position or any other sensitive information. Then, when a device is tested post positive, it can inform other devices in an anonymous way. Now, let, uh, let me consider another example. Uh, so, the monitoring of the epidemic. To simplify, assume we are interested in the number of cases and number of tests. In this case, we don't need data such as the uh, comorbidities or other personal information. It would be enough to collect the results of the tests from the laboratories and share them in an aggregated way to preserve privacy, such as at country level, state level, or eventually city level. So from these, uh, these examples, uh, we see that depending on the application, there can be a huge difference in the optimal data collection and the optimal sharing. In my opinion, uh, the priority should be first to identify the application, so the problem we want to solve with the data, and second, to identify the optimal data collection and sharing for the given application. Uh, what I've seen and what I truly believe is that this should be done on and coordinated at an international level. Today, we see governments putting in place huge efforts all around the world, but there are so many differences in the kind of data that are collected, in the languages and in the formats that are shared, that it is almost impossible to compare the data across different countries. I believe an international standard should set guidelines on which data to collect, how to collect them, and provide a unified access to data harmonized across different countries. This would allow to improve research in the field and to learn effective solutions faster from those who already experienced the problem before us. This is what I've tried in my little home to build, um, and I really hope that can be taken on the next level by uh, more coordination, coordination on an international level. I, I completely agree with you that there is a trade-off uh, that we need to make between uh, the, the yeah, privacy and, and, and solution-based. And you've already suggested a couple of, of solutions, um, basically asking the question, which data do we really need to collect uh, to achieve uh, change? Thank you, Manuele. I, I would I'd like to invite um, Peter up on the stage uh, to share with us um, his view on on that question. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually happy that there's an increased interest in both, both in uh, data collection uh, tools on the continent and the need for data to ensure we have informed uh, decisions. Uh, so that's that's great. Uh, one one I'll talk about the challenges that I see and potential risk, and then ways in which we can uh, deal with some of these stuff. So in terms of challenges, one that comes in mind is to ensure that we have sustainability of uh, such solutions. Uh, most often or not, uh, if we have world uh, developed infrastructure and proper capacity then things are pretty well done, right? So if there's lack of well-defined infrastructure and uh, capacity, uh, then that will be a challenge in the implementation phase. And most of the challenges that uh, come in when we have such initiatives is that uh, sometimes you may have reduced funding uh, after the initial launch of such initiatives, and that undermines uh, capacity and that that could be one challenge so ensuring sustainability is one uh, we also need to also uh, work on uh, data security and um, how do you call it and data literacy uh, 
people have to understand why they are using, why do we need to collect data and what is it going to be used for and what actions are going to be uh, done, uh, used uh, after such data is being collect, uh, collected, right? And uh, that means that people have to also start looking out to find out whether is it actually fit for purpose. Okay, we don't just collect data to collect data, but is the data going to ans answer key questions that existing data uh, is not being able to answer? So this means that we have to start looking at collective intelligence, um, bringing people together, stakeholders, civil society, uh, both the private sector and the public sector, to the table to discuss uh, key questions that data is 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 key to be able to answer and uh, bringing citizens to the table and also building trusted partnership uh, is also key uh, when we are building such initiatives and in addition to that uh, we also need uh, ownership by the beneficiary uh, look uh, communities right so we need ownership so it means that stakeholders. And we have to involve the local people on board on such data collection uh, initiatives. And the last point I will point out would be that there's a need for proper communication and transparency when we are dealing with such uh, data collection techniques. And technology should be seen as just an enabler uh, in some of these uh, situations. So we really need to make use of collective intelligence and build trusted partnerships uh, to be able to move forward on that. Thank you, Peter. I think you mentioned some really important points there. I mean, the collective intelligence encompasses a lot of things, right? You're also picking up this question of fit for purpose that, that Emanuela was asking in a way. Um, but this integration, I guess, is not just on the level of data, but also on the level of society and organizations. Um, so if, before we move on, I just wanted to ask if any of our other panelists want to briefly comment on, on what has just been shared. If not, uh, we will have a lot of more. Yes, Dev? Ah, oh, sorry. I wasn't sure if you were unmuting or not. <laughs> OK. Uh, can yes? I add something up? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, so since we don't have questions, uh, I think one other thing that will be also important will be that if countries or governments are looking into this, uh, we need to build the right um, uh, framework. So we need ethical councils, right? So we need to involve data protection uh, officers and also stakeholders and civil society when dealing with such uh, data collection technologies and also techniques. So uh, just wanted to chip in on, on, on that here. Thank you. I, I, I think you're, you're right that we need partnerships that are non-traditional in, in the sense of we had them in the past. Um, okay, I would like to move on to uh, our next uh, sort of big question. Um, so let me see if I can share again mm, quickly. Okay, it's coming now. So I would like to ask uh, next, what are the methods and approaches uh, used to collect, process, and share data? And in particular, I would like to ask you um, to tell us a bit more about your insights into approaches or frameworks that allow data to be collected and used uh, safely. And uh, yeah, Peter, maybe we can, we can start it off with you commenting on that uh, too. Um, okay, so what we have observed is that the uh, national statistical institutions that really hold data, uh, most of the traditional data that we have, is not being able to answer some of the key questions that decision makers are looking out for, especially in times of crisis, right? Uh, because the traditional data uh, is not able to answer certain key questions, like what's the impact of mobility patterns on the spread of uh, COVID? What is the, what are, and as how do we understand the public perception and behavior uh, in line with interventions that we have had, right? How do we understand leadership uh, on COVID, right? How do we study 
sexual violence against women during the COVID period. You see, so most of them now we don't have such data, and we observe that the private institutions usually have such uh, information, like the telecoms, like the social media com uh, companies, okay, and others, right? So data is really held by these private sector, right? So we need new forms of partnerships, which we call data collaborative. So how do we ensure that the private sector, uh, including civil society and public sector come together uh, where the pri private companies will release data in a much more responsible way uh, to ensure that it is used for public good, right? And some of these partnerships can be done in such a way that uh, we have agreement, obviously. It can be done in such a way that when crisis is being triggered, uh, this data is released. Uh, uh, some of these data can be made publicly available for uh, to drive uh, decision making, right? So uh, we need new forms of partnerships and go beyond the uh, public-private partnership, but something much more uh, advanced where you have all these uh, stakeholders coming and private data being released for public good, for non-profit, but for public good. So that's one way. And another part is that we need much more responsible data stewardship. So we can reuse data or repurpose data that actually exists today in some of these institutions to be able to drive decision uh, making, right? And in terms of uh, approaches, uh, Another area is to also start looking at building ethical councils, right? Uh, to be able to ensure that the human rights and privacy is actually being preserved, right? You've heard of contact tracing that is being used in some countries uh, in Asia uh, where privacy uh, uh, concerns or policies are quite uh, lower compared to the Europe. Uh, contact tracing apps and solutions have been pretty well. Uh, in Europe, not so well. Uh, Ireland, uh, in France, not so well because people are actually private. Uh, the issue of privacy is being, being key, right? But we need solutions like those built by Apple and Google where, um, you have the element of privacy and data protection, uh, protection embedded in such solutions where uh, they encrypt like more like blue tips, right? Trying to not using the GPS and all those stuff. So you randomly generate, um, some codes that are unique, uh, in terms of Bluetooth and then, uh, trying to check the exposure notification, right? So in this case, the data of the individual is actually being preserved, right? So we need solutions, uh, like that. So first on how do we use non-traditional data sources to be able to handle that? Uh, we need new forms of partnership, so that's data collaboratives. And then we need to ask the right questions, include ethical councils uh, 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 in some, some of these particular uh, uh, frameworks. Uh, I think that's, that's what I can say now, unless we have other questions mm -hmm. so that I can go deeper into some of these. You have already uh, mentioned a lot of points. I mean, uh, data stewardship and data collaborators and frameworks for ethical councils, councils I, I think, are some of the avenues uh, forward um, that, that, that can be constructed together. Uh, I would like to um, invite Jules, because I'm sure you have some uh, points to share on, on this uh, question as well. I would love to hear more about. Uh, what you mentioned about uh, integration of data between different platforms. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Franca. Following Peter, uh, to answer this important question, I will say that uh, the method and approach used are different between and within country and depend on the data collection tools available. During the COVID-19 epidemic, we have seen a real desire on the part of the government to use digital methods for collecting and sharing data in real time. However, many have been faced with structural and technological difficulties for operationalization 
of this uh, digital platform at the national level. For, for, for a few years, under, under the leadership of uh, World Health Organi Organization, the majority of African countries have set up uh, a health information system to collect, aggregate data, and produce weekly health indicators. Uh, examples you have uh, DH, DH, DHES2. You, you need the need for real time individual data to, to give public health decision maker an access uh, response measure has arisen during this epidemic. Uh, to, to, to the response of this demand uh, conduct to the development of the uh, DHES2 tracker COVID. However, uh, the operationalization has, has was confronted with several difficulties linked on the one hand to the lack of adequate uh, um, technological infrastructure and on the other hand on, to the weakness of the structure or, of the Ministry of Public Health in charge, in charge of uh, monitoring and maintenance of the health information system. In, in, re, in response, uh, several data digitalization tools were used, relaying a simple database management system to more complex system, depending to the level of the, uh, of the user in data management. Hence, uh, there is a real issues of data sharing, data harmonization, data integration, and uh, data uh, security. Um, as, as, you're, as you're talking about that, uh, Jules, let me ask you actually, um, uh, you, you know, when, uh, also you and, and Peter have been talking about uh, tracing apps uh, for yes. containing uh, COVID-19. And, and these apps has been, have been, on the one hand, demanded as a, as a powerful tool, how we can use technology, and on the other hand, have been criticized to be, for example, an avenue for governments to spy on their citizens. Um, yes. So what is your opinion on and the privacy of these contact, or the issues around privacy with these contact tracing apps and, and similar technologies? Okay. For giving my uh, opinion to this question, I would like to define uh, some key uh, words. The, the contact tracing strategy make it uh, possible to find again the spread of the disease and to control the dynamic of transmissions. However, the use of this contact tracing strategy to fight against the spread of the disease is intrusive. It may infringe citizen right to privacy. It is for this purpose that this strategy is being debated because it pits public health issues against uh, fundamental rights, uh, the right to privacy. If we start from the principle that any interference in the privacy of a citizen is lawful only if it is necessary to, to, uh, to proportionate the, the, the general objective pursued, we cannot oppose this strategy given his interest in public health in the control of the of the epidemic i think the big challenge is to determine how to do contact tracing while preserving the fundamental right of of private privacy in my opinion mm -hmm. I, there, sh there should be a set of priorities for most among which are uh, law 
law on the protection and confidentiality of the data collect on human being. Also, this is a well frame in developing country by regular regulatory agency. Many African countries do not have regu regulatory and legal framework on data confidentiality and protection. For example, uh, a such law was only promulgated in Cameroon during this year. Mm -hmm. I think effort, if effort should be made by the state to set up a legal framework on, on, on confidentiality and protection of data collected by, by the human being. On the other hand, and to establish a, a climate of trust in the use of this strategy, outside of framework of the law, additional guarantee must be taken with regard of the respect of, for pri privacy. Mm -hmm. In particular, uh, you have uh, data, the data must be anonymized. Yeah. Uh, the, data, the data entry must be voluntary and free. In this, case, in this case, it will be necessary to establish a framework of trust with the population to reduce the refusal rates. Those mm -hmm. who refuse should not be put at the disadvantage. Data should be delayed as soon as it is no longer necessary to avoid any overlap. And I think uh, no analysis or use of the data collect during the contact tracing should be considered outside the public health objective for controlling the COVID-19 epidemic. And, and the question, of course, is whether that is possible, right? So, so one, one question is if, if it is possible to um, uh, have uh, the benefits of these contact contact tracing apps without compromising privacy and even if technological uh, implementations um, or solutions to this are possible then the question is how do we move that into implementation and you mentioned a few key challenges there especially uh, trust to the public and also what exactly is the role that the government is playing um, I, I would like to on the, on that specific question i would like to uh, Colin and Dev also on the stage um, to share with us uh, what you what your insights um, uh, into you know the privacy of contact tracing and similar technologies. So I guess uh, this is a question which has perhaps um, divided the entire world, right? Like people could people are arguing either ways. However, the reality is that we live in an era where uh, we have governments who are looking at the benefits of their citizens, but we are also living with governments that are uh, constantly um, uh, showing behaviors that sort of contradict the, uh, the responsibilities that they have towards citizens. Um, even if somebody is looking at it from an ethical perspective, from a responsibility perspective, it is Perhaps to some extent, there hasn't been equal amount of thought gone into uh, designing these apps. I feel like, uh, you know, in most of the countries where these apps have been rolled out, it has sort of been just a quick hustle to get something out in order to do tracing. Um, so one country deployed an app and every other country sort of started following leads without, without thinking much on what could be the repercussions of such apps and the data that is collected with these apps. Um, I guess we are also walking a very thin line between legalities and ethicalities here. So if you go and um, talk to researchers in the humanitarian development space, I think they can actually share a lot of instances where, where even in the past where um, such data was actually collected for a disaster response, um, there were a lot of nightmare stories that came out of that data collection and primarily because uh, when such data is collected, there is a very myopic view that gets taken around this data and its applicability. Um, you know, a lot of um, um, such applications fail to define what is the lifetime of the data. So after the COVID-19 is over, who's going to have this data? Who's going to keep this data? Is this data going to persist um, even in the future? Uh, who will have, like, what could people, what harm could people do with 
access to such a data. Um, I'll quote an instance of, um, you know, Nepal earthquake where, um, and this is one of my favorite example to sort of explain how something that might seem very benign at certain point in time and even beneficially for citizens could actually turn very malicious after that event or after the actual lifetime of that data. So uh, the phone numbers were being used in Nepal earthquake in order to trace people, whether they are buried under the, um, the buildings and damaged structures. And at that point in time, everyone would see this as something that is ethical, that's responsible, that's legal to do because you are literally saving lives of people. However, once the earthquake was over, all of these phone numbers are out there in the open for somebody to misuse. And, uh, you know, but the, the disaster is over. Everyone goes back home. No one is looking at what happens to these apps, these digital systems that we have built in. So I would say that privacy is a very genuine concern over here. Uh, it's also not a zero sum game. Um, it doesn't end up affecting everyone equally. Um, there are marginalized communities who actually end up getting more harmed than what you know, some of us who are privileged enough to have access to these digital systems um, actually get benefited from. So for me, I think I'm actually from the school of thought where I say that there are more privacy concerns that than good that these apps are doing. And there is a need to solve that issue today because such disasters will keep coming in the future. And uh, technologies like these contact tracing apps cannot be a silver bullet for us all the time. Thanks, Dev. Very important points there. Um, I think this is this is quite a key uh, question. So, although you know, we, um, I, I would love to to hear if there's anyone else who wants to chime in on this point. Um, yes, yes I may, uh, um, for me, actually, it's more a matter a matter of trust than a matter of uh, feasibility, because today in the technology that has been just described is already there, is already possible. And the technology and research uh, to uh, ensure privacy is, is quite advanced. Maybe, I don't know because I have no experience, but I have the feeling that it's more like that in the private sector than in the public sector. Uh, Google and Apple released uh, this uh, tracking application and they state that they do not use GPS, that you uh, do use Bluetooth, as Peter was saying. And they use these random identifiers that are unique. They are changing. They are in no way associated with uh, private information. And they are even deleted at, after 14 days. So, um, I, I mean, there, um, there is already a, a lot out there to, to learn from. And I believe it's more a matter of trust in the sense uh, if now people are really willing to trust uh, the private companies that are really doing what they are stating and then what they are saying. Uh, in my personal opinion, I see no incentive to cheat on the game from the private sector so that, uh, in my opinion, uh, this should be a fair game because I see much more advantage in the private sector uh, to gain visibility in, uh, in doing good for society than uh, stealing in a very hard way, some uh, data of doubt uh, use, even because these kind of companies that are uh, huge and leading the world already have this information. So I don't see any uh, incentive to cheat on the game. Thanks, Emanuele. Um, I, I think Dev probably would have some interesting answers on that. I, I want to just uh, jump in with a question we got here from uh, an audience member. So this is uh, Francis Class Peters uh, from Ames Senegal, who's asking, what do you think should be the central concept to the regulation of these data? So both uh, Juro and, and Peter and Def, I think all of you have mentioned the need um, for regulation. So, so who would like to comment on that? Um, I can probably uh, start. Just the, what, uh, what, give, me, give me back the question. What is the... What do you think should be the central concept to the regulation of this data? So, so Dev, uh, please go ahead. So I was just going to say quickly that um, this data is, if not, 
if not more, I think it should be at least treated as the data that we use in the other digital systems, whether these are financial systems, whether these are healthcare systems. So the very foundational concept to the regulation here should be the same as the regulations that are applicable for any kind of data out there. Um, so um, just as an example, because everyone knows about GDPR, all of these apps should be governed by GDPR. And if GDPR has become the gold standard for data security and privacy, then the same has to be applicable across geographical boundaries as well, not just in the areas where GDPR is applicable. Uh, Could you explain what GDPR is? Because I'm not sure everybody would know. Okay. So just um, as I think a quick definition, uh, it's a um, data privacy um, law that has been introduced by European Union a couple of years ago uh, in order to ensure that the uh, data of the citizens, consumers is pr protected. And it's, it's me who owns my own data and I govern where this data will be used and how it will be used for. So it really protects the citizens rights in terms of the data. And it says your data is your own and you sort of decide what can be done with that data possibly. And whoever is using your data uh, uh, should have a, a obligation to uh, inform you how your data is being used. Um, and the same principles needs to be applied to uh, the data that we're talking about here, which is in the context of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steph. Uh, Peter, did you also want wanted to chime in? Yes, I think Dev has said has said has said something very key as one as the GDPR, which is one of the key standards uh, in Europe, and I think other uh, countries are also trying to adapt to that. Um, but I think it depends on the context. Uh, every uh, society in Asia is not the same thing, probably in Europe and probably might not be the same thing even within some countries on the African continent. So that's why there's a need for uh, stakeholders to understand what data intelligence or artificial intelligence or data intelligence is all about. Once there's data literacy, um, we can have the right people on the table to build uh, the right regulatory uh, procedures. Uh, that are uh, centered on the uh, on that on that particular region, right? Uh, that holds world and probably world accepted by the people who live in that particular um, area. So I think data literacy is very important. Consent is also uh, data consent is uh, part of the GDPR. And in terms of data collection, it's important that. Uh, collection of personally identified information, uh, care should be taken, we call the PPIs. So care should be taken when you are asking for information on, uh, on individuals that we can actually trace back to them. And that means that data should be aggregated, uh, to a level, uh, that we can guard against, uh, privacy. But it shouldn't be aggregated in such a way that if we are looking for ways to leave no one behind or identify vulnerable populations, we will have challenges, right? So it should be aggregated at a level that we can still try to identify vulnerable locations or uh, areas that need help so that efficient allocation of resources can be directed to those particular areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and this uh, brings us already to the next topic that I wanted to bring on the table that already uh, came out in, in the discussion, and that is the role of uh, private uh, companies versus the government and also people as, as innovators. Um, so uh, here comes the next question. So what is the role of the private sector and innovators who are developing these data-based innovations to address data governance issues. Um, so, Def, I, I would love to invite you to take the floor on this. Uh, thank you, Franca. So, I guess one of the uh, one of the role that I'm already seeing the private sector companies as well as innovators playing is to to uh, raise more awareness around. Uh, the consumer data rights 
and um, also the issues that exist with respect to security and privacy. I'm fortunate to be part of networks who are doing excellent work in terms of raising that awareness, raising the issues that exist with a lot of these contact tracing apps and all of the other platforms that are coming up, you know, since the, the onset of COVID-19. Um, the other uh, thing I would say is, um, is that private sector, and, and I think Emmanuel touched upon this to some extent in his one of his previous points, um, that the private sector has actually solved a lot of these problems. So I don't think right now it is a matter of feasibility. It is a matter of that trust and intent that Emmanuel was talking about. Um, as just as an example, um, the uh, the security community has been working with uh, zero knowledge protocols and cryptography for years. And what they essentially um, hit with, for those of you who have not uh, heard about zero knowledge protocols before, is uh, that they help you to essentially answer, uh, ask questions from data without revealing the salient points of the data itself. So you have certain data points in your database, you ask a question and what you get back is yes or no, rather than the data itself. Uh, and what you've essentially done there is without actually revealing the sensitive data that might correspond to somebody's health information or other sensitive information, you have really answered or you know accomplished the task that you wanted to in the first place. Uh, in the context of COVID-19, that would mean that um, if you are a government who, who has a contact tracing app and you're recording all of this data around whether uh, you know, where, where are you uh, moving, your, your mobility patterns, but also very uh, sensitive health information, like right? whether you have diabetes, whether you have life-threatening diseases. Um, and they really want to know uh, whether you are a person at risk, uh, you know, due to contact with a recent COVID patient. They should not be able to look at my data and find out what life-threatening disease I have. All they need to know is whether I'm a person with high risk and they, they need the system to answer that yes or no. Um, so I don't have to compromise my data, but also at the same time, not compromise the, the, the efficacy that I'm getting or the security that I'm getting by the use of these contact tracing apps. So um, I, I believe that there is a, a merit in looking at the private sector um, and looking at the solutions that they've already brought up years ago to solve similar problems and incorporate those solutions into this world here. Uh, finally, just to close, I would also say that the private sector and innovators can play a big role in scaling up these solutions without, again, um, you know, uh, without like, while making sure that the privacy, security, and compliance are integrated. Thank you, Dev. I, I think that was a very in, insightful um, answer. I, I also remember that you um, mentioned or that I, I learned from you that uh, not just is there sort of a lack of data governance, but also a lack of acknowledgement for the challenges around the governance of this data for the other side, public versus private. So I think um, the building these bridges and having sort of uh, collaboratives, what, what you also um, what Peter and Jules also mentioned, I think, are key. Um, we have another question from an audience member that I would like to share. Actually, uh, two questions from Laik Merla, who's a data and research scientist, um, uh, I think, in Cape Town, in South Africa. And he's asking, uh, for the greater idea of standardizing the data governance, what measures or strategies do you use to ensure good quality data in the final platform? And then he also says, given that some data sources are not clear and subsequently cannot be trusted. Um, so I think that taps into sort of what we have been discussing already, but I think this allows us, this question allows us to open up the floor also among the speakers in case that any of you would like to comment on this. Peter? Manuela? Yeah, uh, yes. so on, 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 on that, so that's an excellent question uh, on standardization. Um, I think organizations, companies, governments need to start employing what we call data stewards, okay? We need more uh, data stewards to ensure that data is used responsibly. So data stewards, so there are about three areas that we can look at. So they collaborate, they protect, and then they act. 
So when I mean collaborate, it means that these individuals build the right partnerships, right? Uh, the right partnerships that uh, will help in proper dialogue to be able to define the world, uh, the proper data governance that has been needed on the use and the reuse of data. Uh, they also protect, so it means that they also try to find ways in which they c it can be designed and used responsibly, right? And then the third aspect is that uh, data is often being used for analysis, data analysis and all those stuff uh, to generate insight, but that is not sufficient. So we need individuals or we need data stewardship uh, that will move from insights to action. So we need that the insight that is being generated is being used by people who take the right, who take the decisions, right? So these data stewards uh, are also very important because they ensure that we have the uh, data quality that is being well done, okay? So uh, most of the, um, how do you call it, uh, tools that we have like in AI and all those stuff, uh, we need quality data. Uh, so we need timely and quality data. So lack of timely and quality data, we are not being able to uh, get the right output, right? So uh, we, we need people, we need data stewards uh, in these organizations. So that is one mm -hmm. step uh, to be able to, uh, to move forward, yeah. Thank you, Peter. I think uh, Emanuela wanted to share on that point too. And on the question of um, the role of, of innovators versus uh, the private and public sector. Uh, yes, I would, I would like to take the question first because it seems very, very related to what we are doing with, the, with uh, our platform. So I, I can share basically what we are doing. Of course, we, we are not in a position to do partnerships with governments. So everything we do is completely open source and there are many, many limitations. So what we do is the following. We rely on the open governmental data that governments are releasing around the world. Then uh, we try to harmonize this data, so to uh, centralize, to provide the unified access to this kind of data. There are many limitations, right? Uh, like, for example, we don't know if the testing methodology in a country is comparable with the testing methodology of another country. There are many, many uh, things like this that are extremely hard uh, to do. Um, um, on the side of the open source community, so external uh, external of the government. What we do to provide um, our platform is to aggregate this data and to run some checks. So some algorithms are running uh, each hour to check if we have, for example, more confirmed cases than tested people, more recovered cases than uh, tested people. Uh, governments are releasing a cumulative counts so we can check if the cumulative counts in time are decreasing because in that in, uh, in that case of course there should be an error somewhere or the data in the future are not comparable somehow with the data in the past so uh, we do this on an hourly basis and we release it on the website and we provide the, an error log for each data source uh, the errors in the data and uh, there are more than there are thousands of errors of this kind from official data providers. So there is um, definitely, definitely a need to standardize this data. Even uh, within the same country, there can be differences in the date of reporting of tests of confirmed and so on. So when you merge the, date, the data and you harmonize the data, if you have not enough information on the collection methodology, we're not able to harmonize in an efficient way so that you can, um, you see that there are a lot, a lot of uh, mistakes in this sense. Uh, so this, this is um, for, the, for the question. Thank you. Uh, Imanu, I think um, we are already uh, running towards the end of the hour, unfortunately. Um, this session has already been going for an hour now. I can't believe it because I think it felt like we just started. Um, so to, to, to wrap up and also to thank all of our amazing panelists to sharing their insights on these topics, 
I think at least what I took away from this uh, discussion is that on the one hand, there are many challenges, um, but there are also solutions to those challenges, both in terms of uh, building new partnerships and methods and frameworks, and also leveraging the technology that we have to ensure, for example, that people's data is protected. Um, so I, <clears throat> I would like to close by making a little announcement. Or well, let me say, I'm not making the announcement. Um, I'm giving Peter the floor now to, to share some news with you. I wanted to do uh, some I see announcements you. on okay. uh, a Data for COVID African Challenge uh, that's going to be called for innovative projects and proposals that will be launched next week. So is the French Development Agency together with Expertise France and the Governance Lab of the NYU. We are soliciting uh, innovative proposals on the reuse or the use of data in a collaborative and responsible way to provide actionable intelligence for decision makers and people to respond to COVID and probably future pandemics across Africa. So we are, we will, it's open to African researchers or institutions uh, on the continent and obviously with some collaborations abroad, but centered on Africa to ensure that uh, we, we, we... That that I did observe is, uh, is the fact that more people, especially young people, are looking to hear the right information from, um, from doctors or healthcare professionals, people that are at the forefront of um, the, the pandemic or dealing with, uh, with patients um, on a daily basis. So you, I've seen, just on my normal observation, I've seen most people who are um, epidemiologists, doctors, uh, people who are on this task force that are that are really uh, trying to to cut COVID nineteen are the ones that are being followed more than um, than other politicians, I'll say. So yes, we are all looking out to see what are the new um, interesting or what are the new measures that countries are taking in terms of lockdown, the economy, and all that. But I think in terms of healthcare, health professionals have been um, most of the people that have been at the forefront. But one other interesting thing that I saw would be um, the general community of scientists really rattling around and providing um, insights best from that point of view. So everyone trying to explain what is COVID-19, where is it coming from, what are the numbers, what do numbers mean, um, what does this mean for uh, people? And then everyone in their own sector, their own field, trying to see what can I do to help? Whether you're modeling, whether you're building um, in insights or even um, uh, saying, okay, let me distill this information for people. Let me uh, create a solution. So I think that merging of how to explain information, how to support healthcare professionals to to work better and easier for the on the on the pandemic. I think for me that's that was my observation and people um, really trying to, to to get to to hear more words from healthcare professionals than mm -hmm. anyone else um, in the in their communities. Awesome. Thank you very much, um, Esther. It's, I mean, it's really refreshing to hear these perspectives um, mm. to counter uh, the usual narrative around social media being used for misinformation, but the fact that it also gives the opportunity for scientists, for healthcare professionals, and people that we typically don't hear from online to come online and share very useful information. So we've, all, we've come to the end of our session. And um, my last question um, to each of our speakers and indeed to all of us who are following and listening, uh, in case you are keen to make one quick intervention, it's around we as individuals, how do we assess information that we receive um, when it comes to infection projections or infection control? How do we assess information that we have received 
and to, to be able to determine quote unquote is believability how accurate or how correct that information is as on an individual basis are there best practices or things that we can do to be able to uh, determine how accurate or how correct information we, re we receive is so we'll go to dr jc and then we come to dr kivumbi Hello, Samo. Looks like someone is um, frozen out. So, Dr. Kivumbi, can you take over? Well, um, I would look at the source when I, I receive a WhatsApp message. Mm -hmm. I, uh, and sometimes most of it is edited and um, uh, the, uh, is it photoshopped? I have to go to the website that is being quoted uh, to see if that information is there. There was a false information that was going around uh, Uganda, apparently by WHO. So I had to go to the website to look to see whether that information was actually there, and it wasn't. So I would look at, I would go to the website, and if the uh, information is not from WHO, CDC those big, big, big uh, organizations that uh, inform uh, the general public, I wouldn't really uh, believe it until it has been approved by uh, one of those big organizations. So I would find, I would look at the source where the, uh, that information is coming, coming from, or I, or I would confirm that it is actually from there or not. Thank you very much. I think these are some really handy and uh, valuable tips that we can all go home with. Um, Samo, are you back to the session? Yes, I'm, yes, I'm back. Yeah, hello. Yeah, so we had a question on how can an individual be able to assess information they receive in order to determine its accuracy as far as infections, projections, and control is concerned. Yes. Yeah. Hello? The internet okay. is really bad. I don't know whether you can hear me. Um, yes, I can hear you now. The internet is really bad at my end. I don't know whether you can hear me. Yeah, sorry about that, Samuel, but now we can the hear internet you. The internet is really bad, yes. Okay, so, um, yes, so first of all, before you share any information, you need to check its source. Where is the information coming from? Is the source credible? If it is not, this is much, much easier to check. Okay, it looks like um, someone is still having technical issues and um, it's, it's rather unfortunate, but uh, we've had a very brilliant, yeah. very exciting yeah. A very informative um, session. Hello, Samo. Um, a very informative session from our two uh, speakers, Dr. Samo Fusu JC, who is the head of basic and applied biology at the University of Energy and Natural Resources in Sunyani, Ghana. And we've also had Dr. Betty Kivumbi, who is a senior lecturer in at the Department of mathematics at Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, we've had lots of contributions from contributors and participants from around the world. We've had Esther Kunda, who is with the Policy Innovation and Community of Scientists. She's the manager at Next Einstein Forum, um, also sharing brilliant perspectives on this topic. Myself, I'm Gamalia Jao from Just One Giant Lab. Um, we've explored the biology of infections. We've explored modeling. We've explored science communication in the African context as far as this um, topic is concerned. I'd like to say thank you very much to everybody for participating in the session and for your 
wonderful contributions. And um, I hope you continue to enjoy the, the conference as we exchange online. Thank you and goodbye.